excited to welcome all of you to our last day of the conference. Uh, all people here in the room and also everyone who is watching us uh, online. Uh, we uh, we are op opening this last day of the proceedings with uh, a keynote speech by an outstanding guest, Professor Eva Domańska. And uh, this part of the conference will be moderated by Professor Małgorzata Sugiera. Good morning to everybody, um, to uh, both um, who are with us, so with the real reality and in the virtual reality. And I am uh, really um, delighted to have the opportunity to introduce to you um, a distinguished colleague of mine, um, Professor Eva Domańska, who uh, is Professor of Human Sciences at the Faculty of History, Adam Mickiewicz University, Poznań, Poland. Uh, but at the same time, she is a visiting professor at the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology Center at Stanford University in the U.S. She's uh, also a corresponding member of uh, the Polish Academy of Sciences and the chair of the International Commission for the Theory and History of Histori Historiography. Her scientific work focuses on the methodology of history, contemporary theory and a history of historiography, comparative theory of the humanities and social sciences, new trends in the humanities as well as environmental humanities, ecocide and genocide studies. Already from this short introduction, you may guess that uh, she authored over 20 books and many, many articles and you will excuse myself um, that uh, I will not uh, list here every book and every article she has um, written so far. Um, maybe only one piece of information, uh, namely uh, the last um, book by Eva, Necros Prowadzenie do Ontologii uh, Martwego Ciała, uh, Necros, an introduction to ontology of a dead body, uh, will be shortly published in English version as well. So we'll have, uh, you will have op opportunity to um, go through it. Uh, what I would like to um, stress today is that, uh, as far as I remember and uh, being sure I have a very good memory. Eva was uh, always at the forefront of what was going on in Polish, uh, Polish humanities and in the world humanities as well. She was the first to introduce the Polish Academia, Haydn White. Then um, uh, I will um, uh, only um, uh, uh, listen, uh, listen um, uh, some of them, slow sciences or um, um, what is very important, uh, for example, for my students, uh, so much needed affirmative position in the humanities as well. Many of my students refer to her articles uh, about the affirmative position. And um, uh, no wonder that today uh, she will be once again in the forefront and will speak about environmental knowledges and it, I'm very important, as I guess, it's that it's not about knowledge as we used to uh, um, uh, always use the singular, um, but it's in plural knowledges. And she will try to convince us that we are able to um, um, to not so much uh, compare, but really uh, find a way to combine indigenous and Western knowledges. Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much to my distinguished colleague, Professor Małgorzata Sugiera from Jagiellonian University, who was always very close to my intellectual interest. 
and uh, I value Professor Sugira's work very much, so it was a great pleasure that I could be introduced by, uh, by her. Um, I would like to thank the organizing committee, all the members, uh, Aleksandra Brylska, Joanna godlewicz Adamiec, Gabriela Jarzembowska, Piotr Kocimbas, Paweł Pitsztatowski and Krzysztof Skonieczny for, for this invitation to, to, to be a keynote and for the trust <laughs> that I to, actually I can say something that might interest this uh, international um, a group of uh, scholars. Uh, I was online uh, listening to lecture of Professor Dipesh Chakrabarty and Małgorzata Wosińska, who is working on comparative approach to genocide studies, uh, is working on uh, Rwanda and the Holocaust, asked a very important question uh, when uh, Professor Chakrabarty answered uh, mm, with distinguishing between hope and optimism. And Professor Chakrabarty said, hope is a struggle. Hope is a struggle. Um, and you know, for, for my talk, this, this idea of critical hope, the hope that a change is possible, that's supposed to be, I think, an obligation especially right now, obligation for us as a scholar, as uh, academic teachers, is a kind of background story for my uh, today's uh, presentation on environmental knowledges, indigenous and Western. Um, it was uh, in 2012 that I, uh, res uh, last time I had a, a presentation for Academia uh, Artis Liberales, and I was talking uh, about uh, ecological humanities and personhood, and I uh, title the presentation, I am an animist. So um, I would like to continue uh, this uh, interest indigenous, in indigenous ways of knowing, indigenous knowledges, and I will begin with uh, with auto-ethnographic uh, remarks. Um, the presentation is not changing. Excuse me. The presentation is not changing. So I would like to begin with, uh, uh, with a drop of auto-ethnography. And I don't know if you have this, uh, this kind of uh, feeling that auto-ethnography has something to do with coming out. You know, it's like coming out with something. So I'm also doing <laughs> the second of my coming out. The first one was this, uh, um, this public, uh, uh, this public uh, um, uh, statement that I am an animist, and the second one has to do with, with uh, what I'm going to say in a moment. So I would like to invite you to my place where I live in Poznań, and I do it uh, in purpose because watching all this online presentation, I observed different strategies. People, some, some people blur the background, some people do not blur the background, sometimes they have virtual backgrounds. You know, this is a, an, uh, an object of research in itself. You know, what is the background? So when I make a presentation, of course it depends, but sometimes, especially for the first uh, year students, I said that I invite them to my place and so they can see how I am settled and where I am settled. So this is, this is my room, this is my space when I work for the last 30 years. I mean, less, 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 I work less. Uh, except my stays abroad, I sit on the same spot on my couch, surrounded by various things such as books, fetish objects, photographs, all pieces of furniture, plants, of course, as well as my family members. <laughs> and I walk. My room represents my world and everything that is important to me. Each object, many of them are gifts from my friends and from my family. So each object, or I would rather say a subject or better, a non-human person is an important part of my private universe. We have a special intimate relationship. I do care about all of them, and as I do believe, they care about me. Uh, they make me 
feel at home on proper place, feeling, make me feel secure. This is my niche, my barrow. This is what I say to my, my husband, let's go to our barrow. <laughs> Many of these items, human and non-human, organic and non-organic, are also my guides and teachers. Some are my relatives. In a, in a way, the authors of the books that you've seen uh, before, um, they are close to my body space. I feel that they are forming a kind of academic kinship. This is, this is a term that I would like to advertise here by Kathleen McConnell, and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mikołaj Smykowski for, uh, for, uh, um, for alert me to this article that I really cherish. So this is the kinship, which is a choice. I do not locate authors whose ideas I do not share next to my body. My private and intellectual life is just an extension of this small intimate space. Of course, no revelation here. All what I said refers to known microcosm, macrocosm analogy, meaning structural analogy between small and great universe. But let's take a closer look. There are various books where I find ideas close to my worldview uh, that I cite in my writings and also I use in my teaching, which is important. Hannah Arendt, uh, Michel Foucault, Hayden White, Deepesh Chakravarty, and Jan Kiniewicz. You see authors representing different fields and disciplines, classics as well as young scholars. You see Gabriela Jerzymbowska book, which is just above my head when I see it. But there are also other important elements that I like to see as connectors. These connectors that link all these books and authors and various forms of being that are present in my room. I do believe in contagious magic. The things that were in contact once, they remain in contact. So disconnected, uh, these connectors are with grass and eastern palm. These two connectors are important part of my room sky, roomscape. They both relate, attach, and associate not only Western scientific and not scientific knowledges, not only Western scientific knowledge and non-Western indigenous knowledges, but also local Polish traditional knowledge with scientific and non-scientific knowledges, as well as with various indigenous knowledges. By this personal, personal excursion, I want to make a banal, in fact, point that when you look around your own place, you would probably make a similar observation. We are not living in one system of knowledge. If I am a historian, I am not only using a soft science, such as history, uh, very often, if I talk about animal studies, environmental humanities, I also use uh, knowledge that are coming from hard sciences. So, you know, these distinctions are really very blurred. I am living in very different uh, systems of knowledge. These various knowledges and ways of knowing that we use in our academic, public, and private life express also our worldviews, ethics, and beliefs. I was always interested in how scholars' worldviews or cosmologists are manifested in their own writings. I must admit that only over the last couple of years, I become to have a feeling that my academic and personal worldview somehow stick together. I become the elder. This is the point. When you feel that you, your private beliefs and academic beliefs are just getting to stick together, I think that this is the point that you become the senior professor <laughs> and the elder of the academia. So I want to come back to this very, uh, for me at least, important phrase from Helen Sixiu, who said, write yourself. Myself, my body, mind, emotion, and spirit is speaking through my writing. And once I reach this point, I said, as I said, I'm afraid I become the elder. The next step would be to become the ancestor. 
when I'm dead. Part one, this was the introduction. Sweet, sweet grass braids as a metaphor of various knowledges and ways of knowing. My first point in the discussion is simple. In fact, we are not dealing with uh, some dichotomy between Western scientific knowledge and non-Western indigenous knowledges as it is often, often presented. Also, it might be also, uh, even suggested by the title of my presentation that, of course, I treat as a provocation rather than a fact. But we deal with much more complex complex and overlapping systems of various knowledges in case of Europe includes also local, traditional, non-indigenous knowledges, but also in Europe we have indigenous groups, and I will come back to this um, uh, fact. Thus, so-called traditional ecological knowledges might be seen as type of local knowledges, but they might be indigenous or in not indigenous, and I would separate this uh, two. Before I go further, I would like to present a short footage uh, from a talk by one of the most interesting uh, advocates of a bridge between indigenous traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a botanist, citizen, Potawatomi notion, uh, nation, distinguished teaching professor at SUNY, and she calls herself an indigenous environmental scientist. She's also, of course, the author of a famous book, Braiding Sidwas. You must read it. So listen carefully. To introduce today's talk about the teachings of plants, um, I want to introduce you to one of my great teachers, this plant called Wingosh, uh, sweetgrass. Um, Sweetgrass, uh, in our language, that word wingosh actually means something about the beautiful fragrance of that plant. It has a lovely sort of vanilla odor to it. It means the open, um, wet meadows where it grows. And it also means a call to ceremony and a call to prayer because this is a sacred plant for us. This is a medicine plant. It simultaneously heals the earth because it's an early successional rhizomatous perennial that binds up disturbed soil. But it is also a, a healer of, of spirit as well. So this is, is an important medicine plant. And while we call it wingoshk, you may know it as sweetgrass, Linnaeus called it Hierochloe odorata. And in botanical Latin, that means the sacred, fragrant, holy, grass. So I think Linnaeus knew this plant uh, very well. We'll get back to Linnaeus in, in just a little bit. When you see a uh, wingauch like this, you almost always see sweet grass braided. Anybody know why that is? It is certainly stronger. The reason that we braid sweet grass is that sweet grass is part of our creation stories and that sweetgrass is understood as one of the first plants that grows on Earth, and we think of it as the hair of Mother Earth. And so now you know why we braid it. Think about the last time you braided someone's hair, or someone braided your hair. And the gentle smiles that I just saw emerge here um, tell us why we braid sweetgrass, because it's a former of relationship, isn't it, braiding? Um, we braid Mother Earth's hair in the form of sweetgrass as a sign of our tender care for her. And um, so this important plant comes to us as a braid. And we'll have more to say about that in a little bit. This notion of braiding sweetgrass, those three strands, I also use in the, as a dominant metaphor in the book Braiding Sweetgrass, thinking about each one of those strands, or those three strands, one as scientific knowledge, one of them as indigenous traditional knowledge, and the third, the knowledge of the plants themselves. Because both traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge are constructed knowledge by humans. But we also have to acknowledge the inherent wisdom and knowledge that are in the plants. And so that too is represented in this braid, all these ways of knowing. But kind of. Because my language of nature was nature as subject. I understood the plants and the animals, the insects, the birds around me as beings, as persons. 
and that the land, which I was being told was the ecosystem, I understood as a community, a community of, of sovereign beings. And with that worldview, I have to tell you that studying botany was really challenging because the organisms that I had thought of as persons, in a sense, were now um, reduced to objects. And in fact, this was the model that we were given of, of, of ecology, um, that this is what an ecosystem was, the ecosystem as machine, not as um, community. I thought I had wandered into an engineering class by mistake, um, nature as object. Because again, within the indigenous way of thinking, I was raised to understand that every person has these four ways depicted in our medicine wheel of understanding the world, mind, body, emotion, and spirit. And we're always told that unless you understand with all of these four gifts of human beings, you don't really understand it. But in work going to the scientific worldview, I went to a worldview that just privileges the intellect, and that which can be observed and measured by science, but that um, very deliberately sets aside spirit and emotion, are those other gifts that we have. I had walked out of a, um, of a worldview in which land is understood as a web of relationship that brings all those things together. What we didn't really understand, I think, at, at that point was to the, you mentioned pluralism, that you have a speaker coming to talk about pluralism in, in science, that just as we know that the driver of biological evolution is genetic diversity, that if we think about cultural evolution toward sustainability, toward right relationship with the earth, that that requires intellectual diversity. It requires all kinds of ways of understanding our relationships. And that is really the work that we are doing at the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, is to bring together the, the uh, wisdom and practices of traditional indigenous environmental philosophy paired with the tools of Western science to solve our, our most pressing environmental problems. There are two issues uh, raised by Kimmerer that I would like to discuss. First, her way of distinguishing uh, various knowledges. And second, Sweetgrass braid as a representation of relationship between these uh, knowledges. Kimmerer distinguished between scientific knowledge, indigenous traditional knowledge, and knowledge of the plants themselves. And she says knowledge that is in the plants. Sweetgrass braid is a representation of a relationship between this knowledge, but for Kimmerer, sweetgrass braid is not only a metaphor. This is a symbol of indigenous cosmology and a manifestation of the most important aspects of it. You can smell it, who wants to smell it? So Kimmerer begins her teaching with referring to a scientific a taxonomy. But after she explains uh, how sweet grass braids have historical, ceremonial, spiritual, and medicinal value to the indigenous cultures. Sweet grass, as it is believed, uh, uh, it is the first plant to grow on earth. It is also known as the hair of the mother earth. And you know, the indigenous uh, groups call sweet grass the grass that never dies because even when it is cut, it retains its fragrance and spirit. It has healing, uh, uh, healing uh, effects and gather uh, positive forces. Um, it's antibacterial. We can talk about it for, for, for long, but uh, I will just cut it here. What is important uh, for me is that sweet grass, or oh, this is just a scientific proof that it also repels mosquitoes. Uh, what is important for my talk is uh, that sweetgrass braids represent native teaching. Traditional knowledge teaches that one braid of sweetgrass is easily broken, but three braids are strong and difficult to break. S sweetgrass is a symbol of strength. Thus, it gives us an important lesson. Kimmerer her uh, herself says the sweetgrass is one of her teachers, right? So, you know, this idea in uh, Western academia that you might have non-human teachers, it's kind of strange. 
uh, or as my graduate student advisor at Stanford would say, you know, you can't say silly. You say it's different. Okay. So it's different. Right? It's different. But in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, this idea that non-human beings might be teachers is, is like a mantra. Right? So, and especially in terms of plants, because they are our the oldest ancestors. Animals are not as old, but the plants are really old ancestors. We can learn from them. So this, the sweet grass braid is for Chimera, uh, one of her teachers. At least in my case, sweet grass braid is a reminder of the limitation, but also a need of scientific knowledge. So I was very grateful that uh, that uh, Professor Chakrabarty uh, was talking about the, the value of science when we are talking about pandemic and recognition of viruses and, and fight with, uh, with them. We, we see that there is, uh, uh, there is a great benefit from scientific knowledge here. We also learn from sweetgrass, and this is what I learn when I am doing my research, when I'm working, I look at the sweetgrass, uh, which is always reminding me that we should build alliances and kin-like relationships. I'm speaking about academic kinship. And this is our task as scholars to build relations and not prove to break them. And that we need intergenerational teaching. And this is something that current academia is not advocating at all. And it also teaches me the value of gift giving. Uh, it teaches me the value of relationship built on gratitude, respect, and reciprocity. And I admi admire this uh, indigenous uh, teaching, especially because it reminds me of the lessons that I get from grand great grandparents and grandparents. They use different terms and language, but the message was very similar. Since in comparison to scientific language, uh, knowledge, traditional knowledge is universal, practical, long lasting, it appears to values and emotions, and is usually orally transmitted from generation to generation. This is my elder, Hayden White, who is always in front of me, always. So this is uh, when I was doing research in, um, in Argentina uh, with the Mapuche communities. You know, they have this symbol of, of the community uh, which represents the, the intergenerational teaching. So I always uh, think about you know, how we always, uh, in our science, very happy, scientific, uh, in our, excuse me, Western academia, very happy if we meet on our uh, way uh, masters or uh, um, mistresses. Um, that's, that's really a gift. I, I, was, I feel very gifted by meeting Professor uh, Jerzy Topolski and Professor Hayden White as my masters and friends. But sweetgrass is very well known in Poland as Turówka Wonna or uh, Żubrówka. Here we are. Please smell it. The name comes from the term Żubr, the word for the European bison. Please do not say that the American bison is the Polish Żubr. They are related, but they are not the same. And it was believed that uh, um, Turówka Leśna, Żubrówka, uh, is a real aphrodisiac, and it gives a bison strength to those who consume it. Um, so the, the, um, uh, the, the sweet grass in Poland was also used during church ceremonies. It was put on the, on the floor, and when believers were stepping on it, it evaporated a, a certain the smell, it is also called Mary's grass. For Catholics, after all, a sky woman didn't die. It is believed that she was assumed into heaven. I had no time today to reflect on the second connector, meaning the, an Easter palm. So I just want to say that for me, these two connectors are really representing local knowledge uh, Polish Catholicism as well as Slavic beliefs because actually for uh, Easter palm that are associated with celebration of Easter, we do not have palms in Poland, but we have willow 
and willow is used to make a, an Easter palm, and this is a holy uh, grass for Slavs. And uh, it, is, it has <laughs> the same pro uh, properties, that sweet, gr uh, sweet grass. So you're supposed to uh, bring uh, the, this Easter palm home at some point, burn them. You know, you have this uh, reminiscences of, of Slavic uh, pagan beliefs. So at the end, I begin to wonder, am I really so far from indigenous traditional knowledge? Am I really a secular, secular academic? So my, my uh, conclusion from this point uh, of my presentation is that by gathering many different items uh, from many different cultures, uh, we somehow expel a kind of atavistic, uh, affective, unconscious will to reconnect, to make the world a whole again. And it has to do with this uh, idea by Lynn Margulis about the symbiotic interaction that you know we feel somehow part of this network that was once at the very very beginning, you know, a kind of some symbiotic uh, totality. But let's come back to science. The estimated. Uh, for uh, 476 million indigenous uh, people worldwide, 6% of the global uh, population, but what is important to remember is that they bring 80% of the world's remaining uh, biodiversity. We are talking about indigenous cultures, but usually we, we think about non-Western, non-European indigenous populations, but we also have indigenous groups in uh, in Europe. And in fact, the only recognized uh, indigenous people uh, in, of Europe are Sami, uh, living in Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Russia. There are also Greenland Inuits, but they are not, as far as I know, recognized. So w what happened that indigenous traditional ecological knowledge gets so, uh, um, so much attention recently? The push was made in 1992 by um, uh, United Nations with this recognition of a vital role of traditional uh, knowledges for, uh, for saving our environment. So I don't want to go through all these uh, regulations and, and, um, and agendas of European, um, of uh, United Nations, but it's a, uh, Interesting to note that in the Agenda 21 in the Rio Declaration, you have this very interesting phrase about indigenous groups that they have developed over many generations a holistic, traditional, scientific knowledge of their lands. So uh, that's a very, I would say, oxymoron oxymoronic uh, statement mm, uh, to label at that point, traditional knowledge as scientific. But it was meant to reintegrate this, uh, uh, this kind of knowledge into you know, official uh, United Nations agenda. So you know, the blur, uh, the, 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 there was already this blur between science and, and non-science, uh, um, which was a kind of the base of, of this um, idea of uh, modern uh, science. Uh, but we also have to remember that this is the time of the uh, strong fights of indigenous populations. So this recognition of indigenous, uh, traditional indigenous knowledge comes with this uh, um, struggle for, uh, for recognition in terms of legal recognition. But we also have to remember that uh, scholars are talking about indigenous science, right, exactly so, uh, since uh, this time, uh, versus euroscience. So this is not also that we have one science, we have, uh, as they would say, euroscience and indigenous uh, science. So there is no one uh, science. And of course, uh, the emergence of traditional knowledge and its recognition is complicated by the fact that the 
as I mentioned, that the divide between science and non-science was already uh, blurred within European academia, I mean Western academia. When we think about Gayatri Spivak, her idea of epistemic violence, Anibal Quijano, who is talking about coloniality of knowledge, Professor Chapra Chakrabarty provincializing Europe. So, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to maintain this, uh, this divide. And as uh, Arun Agrawal was actually uh, also uh, pointing out, there is, uh, ama even among uh, philosophers of science, like Karna, Popper, or Lakatos, uh, they claim that there is no satisfactory methodology to, to define the border, to have this demarcation criteria be between science and, and non-science. And I would just remind you about Feyerabend, who, who wrote this piece on science, the myth, and the role of the society, who is speaking about science as a historical phenomena and about chauvinism of science. So, you know, so what I'm trying to say is that this push uh, is coming from many different directions, right? So there are discussion within uh, philosophers of science. There is discussion within uh, within uh, academic uh, Western academia related to post um, in, uh, stimulated by postcolonial studies, and of course there is this push coming from indigenous communities fighting for their uh, rights and fighting to, for the recognition of their knowledge. So, at some point, two uh, 2020, and there is another statement by European uh, nations. Who says about uh, that says about holistic worldview and traditional knowledge? So um, this is about building inclusive, sustainable, and resilient future with indigenous uh, indigenous uh, people. Um, yes. So I just uh, um, want to point out and close this uh, this part that uh, if we want to discuss a kind of merge, and I do not want to use the term integration because it's not about integration, of Western science and traditional indig indigenous knowledges, there is no way we can go away from religion or spirituality because the spirituality is very base of this traditional uh, indigenous uh, knowledge. And in fact, the sacralization and the spiritualization of nature and beings is seen as one of the basic cause of the contemporary ecological anthropogenic disaster. So that's, that's the problem. So we have the, the push again from indigenous uh, traditional knowledge who is like trying to, to speak about this value of spirituality. On the other hand, we have post-secular turn in, uh, in Western academia, right? Which is not the same certainly, but it's opening a space for discussion. Uh, about the return of religion and spirituality to a public space and to, of course, um, uh, the academic uh, space. So now I would like to, to talk about uh, how the current paradigm shift is stimulating the interest in traditional ecological uh, knowledge. And as it was observed, um, this uh, paradigm shift uh, happened uh, in the late 90s, the symbolic, uh, the symbolic time is, um, the turning point is symbolically 9-11, uh, uh, which is uh, pointed as a kind of uh, uh, end of uh, postmodernism. Um, and of course, we witness all kind of phenomena, the, the, um, the crisis of democracy, uh, conservative turn that also stimulate a kind of um, a polarization of worldview. And uh, which also has to do with shifting interest and uh, approaches. So in the United States, as well as especially in Australia, Canada, and Pacific Islands, one of the manifestations of this paradigm shift is the process which uh, some, uh, scholars Devon Mishua and Angela Wilson termed indigenizing of the academy. It was in 2004 already. As a result, increasing members of people of indigenous and non-speaking, non-Western, uh, with non-Western backgrounds are becoming researchers and enriching scholarship with traditional ecological knowledge. So one uh, might be digression from Stanford. Um, of course, there is no discussion about uh, uh, 
giving back to indigenous groups the land. But uh, the, uh, the students from indigenous groups are, um, uh, are applying for scholarship and they got all full tuition covered. So, you know, they are being educated by Western Ivy League University, and this is a way of paying back for, for this uh, lens. I think it's, it's very smart also. I, I hope that it would develop. So, uh, the, when, when the scholars and students who are also, you know, participating in my classes, they are coming with their own background. They have different uh, worldviews, right? So, they are loosening this gorset of Western science and Western uh, Cartesian rationality, um, the idea of the relationship between nature and culture, um, the idea of sub subjecthood or, or personhood. So this process have, uh, I think, uh, is in my view of great significance to the future of the humanities. On the other hand, we are, especially if we are working on environmental humanities, the, the, there is this there, is, there are these attempts to build a more holistic and inclusive system of knowledge. So if you look at work, uh, work but, uh, works by um, Anna Singh or Donna Haraway, they are already you know, using indigenous worldviews in their writing and spreading the message that are really influencing what is going on in the humanities. For example, Anna Singh's ideas of uh, arts of noticing this is the indigenous way of knowing, right? And it's being somehow academicized and sell, as an academic point of view, highly, highly influential. Uh, many scholars are talking about interesting in new methods and are talking about arts of noticing, arts of attentiveness. This, this art of noticing has been developed by multi-species ethnography as arts of uh, attentiveness. So, I did this research about what is going on 10 years ago, and uh, since then there are new, uh, uh, new shifts. And for example, the, one of the recent articles by Bruno Latour and Timothy, um, uh, Timothy Lenton is talking not about paradigm shift. They are talking about a shift in worldview. They are talking about cosmological paradigm shift and uh, the same as Viveiros de Castro, who says that ontological anarchism is not enough, that we should, uh, excuse me, that uh, ontological pluralism is not enough, that we should talk about ontological anarchism as a proper meta mode of existence in the Anthropocene. But it's worth it to remember that these ideas are not new. They were advocated by scholars associated with so-called intellectual new age long time ago. Fritrof, Kamp Ka uh, Fritrof Capra, Elizabeth Sangers, Ilya Prigozhin, right? They are all the scholars who, who were talking about this shift uh, um, uh, toward the life sciences, and especially Fritrof Capra was talking about this turns from rationality to intuition, from self-confirmation to integration, domination to partnership. Well, you see the, the modes are, were very uh, similar and with these discussions right now about the, um, uh, the problem with and, uh, criticism of anthropocentrism, Eurocentrism, secularism, and scientism, uh, all together when they they bring together, you see that there are some important things going on. I'm not talking about no dominant humanities, I'm talking about certain areas of interest, especially environmental humanities, animal studies, plant studies, uh, post-colonial studies, ethnic studies, uh, you know, that's, that you might see uh, where it's coming from. I was revisit, uh, uh, revisiting uh, the structure of scientific revolution uh, revolutions recently. I, I, this is not that I am structuralist, but uh, I like the idea of Kuhn that actually the paradigm shift is like a conversion. And there is no uh, comparison very often between these uh, different worldviews that the new paradigm is uh, or paradigms are advocating. And I become to ask myself, what are the different words to which scholars are converting right now? Where are these uh, words that they now choose to inhabit? 
or maybe we do it unconsciously. So if you are working on the environmental humanities, we are just, you know, uh, uh, exposed to, uh, to text on indigenous uh, knowledges, indigenous words of, uh, uh, ways of knowing, and we learn not even knowing it, right? We absorb it as we absorb uh, academic knowledge. So now, and this is the last part, and uh, uh, kind of I will be uh, concluding soon. I would like to talk about complementarity between uh, current Western humanities and indigenous uh, knowledges. So this is a, um, a graph that somehow summarizes what is going on right now. You have all this prefix in words like bio, for example, in my, my case, as a historian, biohistory, ecohistory, phytohistory, geohistory, indigenohistory, indigenous history, neurohistory, necrohistory, and so on, so on. Whenever you encounter this prefix, you are in the new paradigm, right? There are like markers. These prefixes, there are like markers of, uh, markers of this new interest of different areas. Uh, related to ecology, biology, geology, indigenous knowledges, neurology, um, necro stuff, techno, zoo, and so on and so forth. And of course, we are witnessing all sorts of turns, all sorts. You know, I opened <laughs> each periodical is talking about turns. Of course, there are only some of them. But if you look at them, you will see that they are somehow also m uh, marking these changes which are opening up the space for the ideas which are uh, similar uh, mm, uh, between indigenous ways of knowing and knowledges and uh, Western uh, knowledges and uh, Western science. And they are related to relational turn. That's, that's, you know, indigenous knowledge is all about the relationality, right? Ontological turn, speculative term, practical, participatory, non-human, species, indigenous, animist, and so on and so forth, right? So you can see the traces of all this, uh, uh, all this uh, ways of knowing uh, knowledges that might be occupied by Western science, but also maybe occupied by ideas, ideas coming from um, from indigenous ways of knowing. And especially this recent, uh, uh, recent, um, uh, uh, recent push toward going from reflection and analysis, we already analyze everything which is necessary to know what is going on in the world, and interpretation, we also know what is what is wrong we criticize we, we have this critical analysis during postmodernism and now we need strategy so now we are talking about applied humanities how the humanities might actually propose some concrete strategies to deal with uh, contemporary problems social political ecological uh, what have you right we also have even applied history, which is visible, especially in, for example, in public history, which is not scientific, right? They, they have not this method, method that we uh, traditionally use in historical um, research. <clears throat> so an interesting um, aspect of non-anthropocentric, post-eurocentric uh, humanities is that, in fact, its pro-ecological pro principles and the ethics based on respect, reciprocity, and responsibility are also principle, principles of indigenous knowledges. The model of socially useful, engaged, and implied uh, humanities that focus on the building of practical knowledge and experimental learning, popularity of fieldwork humanities, right, like anthropological approach, fieldwork uh, humanities and participatory research, this is getting more and more popular. All these uh, interests uh, are uh, having something in common with indigenous ways of knowing. Case study method, which push you to focus on very concrete uh, uh, problems. The interest in citizen science, <coughs> very, uh, uh, very hospitable 
for ideas coming from indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, as you know, uh, you know the, the indi uh, indigenous uh, groups, uh, uh, we learn through practicing something, right? So the practice is very important. It's uh, all experiential, it's participatory, including participatory research with non-humans. This is the, the book published by Academic Press. Also, post-secular turn made us aware that we have never been fully secular and that our academic research are somehow crypto-theological, uh, theolo especially in case of, of history. Uh, we know, for example, when we observe from that point of view, when we did this post-secular reading of memory studies, you know, the memory studies, this is the <laughs> great example of, of this crypto-theological uh, ideas the idea of forgiveness, social sin, uh, and so on and so forth. Also, I, I observe among young scholars that are moving away from abstract knowledge acquisition through reading to concrete actions inspired by field research. And this uh, also very often inspire the development of local uh, knowledge. So the researcher, not only in ethnographical research, but in many different fields of humanities, the researchers become a practitioner uh, among the, the local, uh, in the local uh, environment. And you know, these ideas which are coming from below are also uh, important to change the face of the contemporary uh, humanities. So the, the researcher is not talking the humanity, saying, instructing the humanity, uh, the community about its past and identity. It's like co-creating it um, or is trying also to resolve the problem of, of given community. Okay, and conclusions. Uh, aho, okay, so wha what I wanted also to say that if you are in plant studies, like focusing on Kimmerer, who is uh, working on the botany, uh, also the scholars who are uh, working on this subject is on the one hand, uh, uh, showing how uh, indigenous knowledge is confirmed by neurology of plants, for example, right? So they are trying to uh, build these bridges. And the knowledge, uh, the uh, traditional knowledge is already uh, used in different management agenda. And uh, there are many books which are trying already to bridge these two kinds of knowledge. I need ju just a couple of them. So in this context, to conclude, it's worth considering how we might think right now about goals of knowledge building. What is the goal? And I think that our goal today is to build knowledge that would show us how to live together in conflicts, not only in conflicts between human, humans being, human beings, but also in conflicts with the environment and, and uh, non-human beings. Also, we should be prepared to this ongoing and um, accelerating crises. So the idea of culture of preparedness, the ability to be prepared for certain crises and, and, and problems, even catastrophes, uh, building resilience and uh, the sense, uh, I mean, the possibility of adaptation in many different uh, um, difficult situations is really crucial. So we are talking about emergence humanities. We are talking about preventive uh, humanities. So um, I think that we might also use potential which is in, uh, in indigenous ways of knowing. Uh, this is not only that uh, indigenous peoples for thousands of years have developed knowledge that build resilience and allow them to survive. But you know, the survival paradigm is it a problem in itself. Right? This is the utilitarian value of indigenous knowledge. It is also a social construct. It's a very good article by Zygmunt Bauman on survival as, uh, as a social construct. So, you know, not all of us are survivalists. Not all of us would claim that we deserve as human beings to survive, right? So this uh, treating indigenous knowledge as a kind of laboratory, how we can build this uh, uh, survival capabilities is also 
questioned by indigenous uh, groups because they uh, feel that the, the knowledge is used in an instrumental way. Um, so there are a lot of problems, but still, uh, uh, still I think that there are some conceptual deposits of knowledge, and this is the phrase used by uh, Jacek Wachowski, conceptual deposits of knowledge which are uh, resting in uh, indigenous uh, ways of knowing, like my favorite animes. I'm speaking about new animes. I'm not speaking about this you know, belief in spirits. But the new animes, which is about how we can uh, recognize a person in other being which is not necessarily human, right? So this is an educational project, how we can, with respect and reciprocity with this idea of gift, which is given to us by Earth, might somehow change our consciousness or change our attitude toward the world and other uh, beings. So uh, the idea is, and the question is, how we can build the world where is a space for many worlds, even parallel. This is our obligation as scholars and teachers to sustain a critical hope as long as possible that the change is possible. And uh, I, I mean to sustain the hope as long as possible, critical hope as, uh, as, uh, as long as possible, despite all these negative happenings that surround us. And we can also close, I can also close this talk by reminding you about this idea of responsibility, ability to respond. And I ask myself, and uh, if I have, if I develop over this, you know, 50 years of learning, the ability to sense that something is calling me to do some action, and if I am uh, ready to respond for, for this call. Thank you. This is for the discussion. If you are interested, there are already many different graphs that represent the overlapping uh, uh, aspects of Western science and traditional native knowledge. So. Uh, we might uh, discuss it if you are interested. Yeah, thank you Eva uh, very much for this talk full of new ideas, approaches, and I guess you are eager to uh, share your comments um, uh, with us or uh, ask questions or share ideas and comments, as I already said. Um, uh, people uh, who are here are kindly invited to come and uh, take a stand um, behind the micro. It was Eva's idea um, to invite you to the same place uh, she was uh, talking from. Um, for the people who are... <laughs> yeah, it will be a kind of prize for you if you uh, come here. Um, and for uh, and what about the people who are in the virtual space? They may uh, commented it on the chat, but what about smelling uh, sweet grass? <laughs> uh, I would suggest buy online. Yeah. Okay. Once you want to uh, smell the sweet grass, uh, buy online. It will be, I guess, cheap. Um, so who who will be the first to uh, yeah okay uh, would you like to come here or if you insist I may uh, okay Yeah, it's a long way. Or you may have this one, yeah. Thank you, Professor Eva. That was a wonderful talk, all packed into different ideas. This is uh, like a comment. I'm not sure uh, how well this gels with your uh, paradigm, but I guess just a suggestion and maybe a way forward. So you mentioned that uh, uh, there are different pushes from different directions, which is probably making the indigenous knowledge systems very much 
in line with um, the dichotomy that we probably thought existed before in the form of Western sciences. There is a slight push that hardly goes recognized many times, but that is definitely coming from a very small group of cognitive scientists who are studying smell linguistics. One example that comes to my mind is Professor Asifa Majid, who was before in uh, the Netherlands, and now she has probably gravitated towards the UK. And the idea of her research is to uh, dig up words that existed for several cultures, defining different kinds of smells, which we have probably lost. So for instance, we have various color terms for defining colors. But if we were asked to describe smells, we would probably say chocolatey-like, uh, minty-like, or flowery, or something like that. But we don't have an original word for smell. So even though that research has stayed in the laboratory of smell linguistics, but I think the broader implications is that we bring it out into the field. We want to see how we basically build our relationships with the environment, which was based on smell. So for instance, people looking out for the monsoon could smell the wet soil and have different terms, just as the Eskimos have different terms for different forms of snowflakes. So in a similar fashion. And if we bring this out even extend the smell uh, philosophy further to the idea of uh, paganism. One direction that I have recently stumbled upon is how basically people looked up to the skies in the ancient times and uh, the sky served as a lot of motivation for uh, their philosophies for their worldviews and cosmologies. So the idea is they built elaborate smell sensors in order to reach up to the skies that had different motives. So just by bringing too much right now in these two minutes, the idea is to say that smell probably formed that lost bridge that we are trying to rebuild now in order to gain further insights into our relationships with the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Eva, do you want to respond here? Yes. Thank you so much. And uh, of course, you know, in Western culture, we really focus on sites, right? And we already know that there was a long discussion in Western humanities how this, uh, uh, you know, focus blurred uh, different perception. But, you know, if you look at the recent research, there is so much research even in quite conservative history about emotions and, and about senses and about the hearing and smell. So I think it's progressing, right, this, this recognition that we should uh, develop not only the sense of sight and, and hearing, but also taste and, and, and touch. And, and speaking about you know, resonances, how you can actually ex uh, accelerate our capacity to feel through our skin by resonances and, uh, and so on. So I think it's progressing, right? And I hope that at some point they will meet. And uh, yeah, that's why I will give you that smell, right? So you, you also, you know, and also, I, I, well, I want to say that this, um, this comment about language and how language uh, uh, is important, it reminded me also of the um, uh, um, braiding sweetgrass because uh, Robin Will, uh, Kimmerer is also talking about the grammar of animacy, right? And how different uh, languages are uh, having more verbs than nouns, for example, that uh, she claims that English language uh, is um, uh, focused on objects, have many, has many nouns, while her language is focusing on verbs, so it's more about doing, right? So I think, you know, that all these linguistic uh, uh, considerations are really helping to build this, because, you know, I, I, as I said, I'm not talking about integration. I'm not interested in that. I just rather uh, think how knowledge that are coming right now from many, from many different fields can in the future build a kind of more holistic and including, uh, in, uh, inclusive knowledge that uh, will uh, have science as one of many of them. Uh, of course, I'm not talking about ten years, right? I'm talking about the distant future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and I saw Deepesh signaling his willingness to have some uh, physical exercising. <laughs> a s very uh, small uh, walk here to join us. Where is my sweet grass? Uh huh. It starts. <laughs>
three breaks. Mm -hmm. One is not enough. Yeah, thank you, Deepesh, for coming here. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Eva, for that very, not just engaging, a very thoughtful talk. I was trying to do a mental exercise while you were going through your talk, and could we get back to the Fairband quote? That's it. Right, right, right. So, I, I mean, I agree with you that, you know, that creating a binary between Western and non-Western or indigenous is not helpful. And the first sentence actually is affirming that the separation of science and non-science is not only artificial, but also detrimental to the advancement of knowledge. Uh, now, read the second sentence. If we want to understand nature, no problem. If you want to master our physical surroundings. So he is actually saying we need to combine all that for this purpose of mastery. And we are now critical of the idea of mastery. And, and I was trying to think what word, with what word would I replace the word mastery? And I was having trouble. In other words, the current crisis may be that the crisis is not that we can't bring these different knowledges together, but the crisis is in thinking to what end will we do it. So Robin Kimmerer says in the beginning of her book that I am writing this book in order to heal our relationship to the earth, right? But you see, no healing is permanent. So any philosophy of healing must implicitly acknowledge that there has to be a philosophy of illness, right? I mean, it's like you can't replace it with harmony. No harmony is permanent, right? You, you have to constantly work at it. So, so the exercise I want to do with you is to, to with what word will we replace it? And, and, and the problem is that if you think of healing, you think of harmony, and if you grant me the proposition that these are all unstable states, there is no permanent equilibrium then you need some other way of acknowledging conflict, war, things that we describe as illness in the metaphor of healing, right? So that's, what I was, that's the exercise I was trying to do, and I invite you to join me in that exercise. Oh, thank you. Please, please don't leave, okay. uh, because, you know, I, I just want to, uh, I hope that uh, I was clear that I am not dismissing science. In contrary, you know, in contrary, right now we need science, and uh, also, for example, in, in history, we know how memory politics is fused by these local knowledges or paranoidges that we have to fight with really scientific uh, historical research, right? And the problem is that historians are losing this, uh, uh, this, uh, this status of uh, uh, providers of truth, you know? That's, that's the problem. So, you know, I'm not dismissing science. I, I'm just thinking about how we can build uh, uh, more holistic and inclusive knowledge in the future on the based on all these different kinds of knowledges. I also uh, not uh, romanticizing indigenous knowledges, right? I'm not romanticizing, and actually, even within the indigenous studies, you have critical indigenous studies, and the indigenous scholars are also critical about their own knowledges, as we are critical about our own knowledges in Western academia. So the, the, I, do, I do agree that we have uh, uh, serious problems, especially in East Central Europe. So for example, when we are talking about going beyond anthropocentrism or beyond Eurocentrism, as a uh, person uh, uh, born in Europe, uh, born in, uh, in Poland with all these historical experiences, I would be very, very careful what I'm saying. Um, because we actually need a strong human subject to fight all these crises, social, political crises that are going on. And I'm not speaking about the strong subject in this kind of homogenic way, right? But I come back to this, uh, this discussion how we can build a strong subject after postmodernism and what we learn from it. So speaking about mastering, well, the stewardship, 
occurring, right? But but I do agree that that this is this is very difficult. That it uh, requires also this change of meta language. I I, I know that. Uh, yeah, all I'm saying is that it's very hard to um, to find a replacement for that word, which would not be open to criticism. And that is, in a sense, I feel the crisis we're inhabiting. In writing in 1975, I mean, Fairbairn, who was an anarchist, right, in terms of scientific mm. method, people didn't like his book on method. Mm. Um, but he could at least write with the conviction that mastery was a good thing. And today we know that mastery is open to objections, but we don't know if we have another word to replace it with that would not be open to any objection. Mm -hmm. And that is, in a way, the critical place and time we inhabit. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was very interesting. So I just doing the mental exercise. Yeah, there, but the mastery might be caring, but maybe oppressive. Like having a master who is caring and supportive or oppressive, right? So uh, all of those positions. Like if you become, like in loco parentis, it would be open to certain kind of. So the, very I mean, I, I'm not trying to solve the problem. I'm simply trying to deepen the problem by saying how deep our predicament is. That as I was thinking, with what, what will be my word there for mastery? Mm -hmm. I couldn't find one that would signify a universal agreement. Whereas in his time, he thought yeah. that mastery signified some kind of universal agreement. So he wrote it you know, like even without thinking about it. Yeah, but this was a propagandist. <laughs> it's, it, you know, this is the ideological piece. Yeah full of this uh, very specific language. Look at this phrase, uh, uh, you know, he said, uh, the, the next sentence that I didn't quote, but it's uh, so typical, um, so typical of him, it was like, uh, anyway, so he, he was a particular scholar, but uh, okay, he says something like that. Let us free society from the strangling hold of an ideologically petrified science, just as our ancestors freed us from the stranglehold of religion. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a very particular piece with a very particular sure. agenda. So I just <laughs> put it just to remind you about this piece, because of course, Lech Strauss also was talking about the science as a myth of the, of the West. Right? So. Anyway, I just want to raise it. Thank you for a very stimulating. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um. Okay. Thank you, Dipesh, and thank you, Eva. Um, we have uh, a an, 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 an comment from chat that it would be nice if you could speak to the mic. Otherwise, they having difficulties uh, listening to. And we have... Um, Ola, who want to take a stand here. Thank you for this amazing talk. And I have a question which troubles me for some time. And I, ver I am very interested about your stand on it, about this discussion when we talk about indigenous knowledge, about this threat of accusation and exploitation of indigenous knowledge by, by the West. I mean Western science, but also Western ideology, I mean neoliberalism and capitalism, how, how to deal with that, that we are using indigenous knowledge to deal with the problems created by the West and how to be more cooperative, not dominant. Thank you so much. Well, this, this is a real problem and this is, I, I, I'm afraid it's going to be a long lasting process is um, somehow advanced in uh, countries like uh, Canada, for example, or, or Australia. Um, when I was uh, doing this research, I told you in Argentina with the Mapuche community, they said that they are already invited by the University of Nanquen to cooperate with students, to, to teach courses, to come and talk about their culture. So, you know, it's progressing very, very slowly. And I feel that the more actions like that we have, the more sensitive we become to all these issues. So um, this is also the question of us as teachers, how we, uh, how we form our syllabuses to smuggle, I would say, <laughs> I'm speaking you know, from my Polish position, to smuggle this indigenous knowledge as important to, uh, 
uh, and as a, as a kind of uh, com uh, complementary, uh, uh, as a kind of complement and uh, complementary supplementary knowledge for now, because this is you know. I know that this is like uh, going uh, from the closet or something like that, back, um, back door, you know, actions, but I think that we have to start uh, with something. Because imagine what could happen if uh, somebody would uh, misunderstand these ideas. This is an open sp space in Poland, in East Central Europe, for all these non-scientific uh, ideas of Great Lechia, for example, and this is the local knowledge, right? Developed by local communities, and and they know history. Well, th th this different than historical, but who says that it's better? Maybe it's better for survival, right? So you know, we have to be very careful what we, what we are doing because we are advertising, <laughs> you know, the, the value of local indigenous uh, knowledges, traditional knowledges, but it might be used by some agendas against uh, a society even. Yeah, thank you. Uh, when we have, we have already another question or comment. Dear uh, Eva, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, my name is Olena Tiaglova and I'm from Vienna University. Um, there are many different indigenous people over, all over the world. And Robin Kimura writes in uh, her books, um, in her book, that uh, indigenous people consider nature as subject. And in Western paradigm, nature is object. But what's the question? Do indigenous people in different countries consider nature a subject or, for example, Russian indigenous people consider nature as object? That's a question. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Of course, we w I was not talking about Russia when you have all these indigenous communities, 100 Exactly, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the problem. And of course, we can't homogenize that. Uh, and even if you talk with, uh, with older generation of uh, of uh, Poles working on agriculture, or even when you talk with your colleagues who have gardens, right? They have different attitude to the soil than, 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 uh, than inhabitants of, of, uh, of big cities, right? So, you know, this is not so easy to differentiate. And uh, I understand that this talk was more to problematize some issues and to put some, uh, some ideas on the table that uh, are not easy to uh, to re to be, uh, to, to re be uh, resolved, but what I would say, whenever I want to do some concrete studies, I go to case studies. So you have a very concrete case of very con concrete community, and you study how, what is their attitude to toward the uh, earth and the soil, and and what is their co uh, cosmology, and you do some comparative studies. Right? This is the way of doing that, because this is definitely a very general lecture, right? And, and uh, that's very difficult to, to speak about details here. But uh, yeah, case studies, very concrete uh, research. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking around here. Yeah. Yeah, please come here. Yeah. Is it possible if we can see the cover of the book Indigenizing Oh, yes, that's it. Uh, yes, and uh, I, I'd like to talk about this cover because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a paradox. We can see the classical Western building on the cover, and uh, if we read the title, it's something different. And it shows how the problem is strong. And uh, I have a question to you. Uh, what is the role of this classical aesthetics of thousand and a, uh, 2,000 and a half uh, years uh, in this talk, in this relation with uh, other cultures? Mm. So you are absolutely right, but remember this is 2004. Okay. So it's the uh, things already progressed. Yeah. This is uh, Arizona Press, mm -hmm. and in Arizona we have a, a strong representation of the uh, indigenous uh, indigenous North American uh, Americans, right? So, 
I think that this is one of the first book that was so openly talking about that, but I totally agree. And that's why, as you, uh, as you see, I brought some you know, yeah, things yeah. which are the symbols of indigenous and, and uh, this is what I am trying to do, you know, to be also honest with myself because uh, you know, this is not that I'm going native, right? That's, that's, that's the other problem. I just have colleagues and friends who are indigenous and they teach me. You know, I learn, I am a scholar. I learn from everything and from everybody. This is my nature. Wonder, I wonder. I would never grow old, I have no time. Uh, that's the one advantage of being a scholar. So, you know, I would say that uh, this idea of being attentive, not only noticing, because noticing does not need any action, uh, 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 um, but, but uh, being attentive to things that you might learn and actually adapt uh, in your own way of teaching, thinking, your worldview. But of course, this is very eclectic. You know, some people are dogmatic and they like to stay like that, right? They are not open-minded. So that's, uh, but this is individual choice. Right? And this is also the, the problem of our responsibilities. So if you ask about the aesthetics, you know, I just uh, see that on the, on the academia, you still have the symbol of the, the yes. I think it's Lakota, I don't, I, 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 I don't want to <laughs> say things that I'm not sure about, but this is a uh, symbol. I mean, this is the university and uh, there are a, a lot of uh, indigenous scholars in Arizona, right? Uh, so. Uh, what about aesthetics? What about uh, the, the term indigenous science, right? So the academia is related to this Greek <laughs> representation of academia, but, uh, um, well, I don't know what to say. It's I mean, difficult. It's, it's a big problem because if we understand, if we think, if we think philosophy, we imagine Greeks. For example, if we think uh, academia, we see classical buildings. So I just wanted to comment it. Because I'm an, uh, an architect. Mm -hmm. I'm from the uh, Faculty of Architecture from the University of Technology. And um, I'm thinking about this problem. But you will change something by your project. Yeah, I'm doing it and I'm writing about this. Yeah, but I, I, I wanted to talk about this. Uh, how we think, how we, we imagine it. I think this image is quite important. And it is, but you know, we are all doing some consciousness raising, right? By our work, uh, writing or uh, concrete projects. Uh, so when you design something that would look different, even the classroom, you know, for example, look how this room is designed. This is so typical Western academic. You have a professor here, you have students here. No indigenous ways of uh, teaching would, would promote it, right? Would students are sitting in a cycle, right? In a cycle. There is a cycle teaching, and this is the cycle that the uh, sweet grass is burned to uh, to gather, the, excuse me, the good spirits and neutralize bad energy, right? So there are all these rituals that we do not really. Are you interested in, for example, this kind of, you know, collective teaching? You know, for example, I invite my graduate students to my place, to my home. They don't even know that this is what I learned from my indigenous colleagues. They said, if you want to build a group, you have to have a private space. You do not have classes in academia, right? So first you have to build a group, and after you can teach them. This is what I learned from them, not from my... Well, also, Hayden White was like that. <laughs> so, you know, I have teaching from both sides. Uh, but th there was some, definitely some lessons that I include in my teaching, and nobody even noticed that. The question is, do you have students who are interested in this kind of learning? Right? Because not all of them uh, are, you know, uh, open to this, uh, this kind of teaching. But, but I look forward to your project. Okay, I can show you later. But I thought on a project, some you know, school or something that would mm -hmm. involve this kind of, you know, more group learning and, well, it's already done, I know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with this conscious that it's coming from that side and not from the side of Western. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want to change Western architecture. Uh, uh, my, 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 my,
Um, because I think there is a lot of good things in uh, classical architecture, but uh, we see it as uh, oppression in the world. And I wonder what is the role of this. And it's for me it's a task, it's quite interesting thing. Yeah, but we already have the constructive architecture, you know, for example, Lieberski, who is absolutely phenomenal of uh, bridging, you know, something which is old with something which is very advanced. This is not that you have to love him, but at least there is an idea, right? And I like this, this idea of bridging old and very new, very avant-garde. I, I think it works, uh, at least from my completely ignorant point of view on architecture. Okay, thank you. Uh, when speaking about books and covers, um, I um, don't know if you know how the very simple but telling title of Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, was translated into Polish. It was translated, uh, translated like Pieś o Ziemi, so song not of earth, about earth. So it was. Um, very telling that it's uh, not the same way of thinking about what the book is, uh, why is it important, it was rather uh, it try to inscribe the book in Polish ethnography and um, to uh, in Polish folks knowledge, well, so to say. to have a title, Skleciona Żubrówka. People would say that this is an <laughs> advertisement of... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we have still five minutes left, yeah. Could you come here or, yeah. I was wondering if there's somebody else behind me. Do you want to have this mic? Yes, uh, thank you, because then it, it, it is easier. My name is Katarzyna Fervor Chorawa. I'm from the University of Warsaw Philosophy Department. And I'm writing on aesthetics, which means sensitivity, let's say, and aesthetics. <laughs> uh, and um, I wanted to continue just with one remark uh, that uh, uh, Professor Chakrabatha and you discussed uh, uh, concerning the aim of this perhaps critical a uh, way towards um, uh, uh, or critical hope because I was going to say critical way towards hope perhaps this is also the, the right way to say it but I have a proposition that perhaps the goal uh, instead of uh, in place of mastering nature could be being sensitive uh, so the paradigm shift would be of the sensitivity, not the mastering, of, or even not the knowledge itself, but the, the sensitivity that we are gaining through uh, uh, this understanding. So and the, the, the goal of understanding would be the sensitivity. And then the sensitivity makes us understand things in a different way. So then uh, we can perhaps uh, feel more comfortable with the word uh, that the goal of, uh, of academia even is the sensitivity, the, 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 the shift of sensitivity. If we are trying to find a word that will be comfortable for everybody. Because it also applies and um, suggests this circular circular uh, structure that uh, the knowledge builds sensitivity and sensitivity builds knowledge. And then there is a question in the end, because uh, Professor, you ha uh, had written about performativity. So I'm curious, uh, have your views changed or perhaps now are different from those that you ha had written um, before? Because these I can read, but perhaps now you have some some insights on perform performativity and in, in perhaps also towards the agentiality. This is the English pronunciation, sprawczość, which I like in Polish. The 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 translation in in Polish for the agential 
means um, it gives you more sense of, of really being um, uh, the cause, but also the the effect of uh, the the circular uh, aspect of of uh, agentiality. So uh, a little bit about uh, performativity. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. And speaking about aesthetics, uh, you know, we already noticed also in Western academia how aesthetics is criticized, and that aesthetics is uh, uh, gender specific, is elitist, right? Uh, is is race specific, and so on and so forth. So you know, this this criticism of aesthetics and this move from aesthetics to aesthetics, like in Wolfgang Welsh, yes, is also exactly. like a move toward you know the bodily experience and the recent interest of recovered interest in phenomenology, which is picked up by indigenous scholars, in fact. You know, there is this, uh, this interesting recent publications about how phenomenology might uh, be connected with some ideas from indigenous knowledges, because it's all about perception and, and, and body and so on and so forth. So uh, sensitivity, I understand, but, uh, you know, of course, the senses are necessary for, for knowledge, right? So. Uh, so what you mean that the senses should be prioritized uh, <laughs> and, uh, in building the sensitivity? And not, not exactly, and I'm writing a whole uh, dissertation on that, which will be too long now to explain. <laughs> but we can imagine that uh, in the non-anthropocentric perspective, we can still talk about both senses and communication, which means that sensibility is not only about senses, that uh, all organisms, even those inorganic, we can claim uh, as indigenous people, see it also that, that everything is, has the senses as if, and also everything communicates, which means that there is sensibility. And for me, just to dismantle, the, and I need three words to describe different aspects, that's for me, sensitivity is like the two together, senses and sensibility, being able to be meaningful to, 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 to each other. Uh, but in the, the communication end, is absolutely uh, uh, crucial, right? Because we prioritize language, but in fact, if you want to open yourself, ourselves to uh, these ideas that you are talking about, we have to uh, somehow open ourselves to uh, learning uh, through, uh, through signs and gestures and so on and so forth. So, you know, also these ideas of, for example, um, how we can communicate with animals and plants. Uh, because plants communicate uh, through chemical signals, right? So that's why semiotics is so important right now, right? And how, but the problem is, do we really want to learn how to communicate with plants or, or even animals? You know, I'm sure that there are many animal lovers in the audience. Have you ever read any books on biocommunication that would allow you to, to perceive the, the dog or, or a cat in a more, let's say, non-human way? Because, you know, we give orders by, by language, but, you know, even the odors or even, you know, the waves of the tails, it's not so simple as we think that, you know, the taste is just, you know, being happy, right? So I read the book on biocommunication, I learned something. But the question is, you know, do, do you want to reinvest our time in, uh, in thinking about that? Because I do understand that if we learn more about the biocommunication and phyto, semiotics and so on and so forth, we could be even more open to this ideas of relationship between sense and sensibility and so on and so forth, right? I claim that this is the case. That although your example shows us that if we read a book about the communication with dogs, this doesn't make us communicate better with dogs. But in the end, it may give us more sensitivity about it. Mm -hmm. So the knowledge somehow uh, is important in this moment of becoming moment process process of becoming more sensitive to a dog, right? Although the book perhaps is very uh, theoretical, uh, so that is a nice thought uh, that we can include mm -hmm. things, not exclude, right, all the time. And I'm using also the dis diffractive method of Karen Barad, so so I, I favor uh, overlapping things 
other than comparing and excluding and saying this yes and this no. That's why also the answer to my colleague that, that I also uh, know about the architecture and classical stuff uh, being actually a diffractive uh, network or, or, I don't know, a mesh that you can look through, right? And uh, perhaps, um, yeah, I think this is enough because we have sort of, I just wanted to propose this, this, um, this perspective, which is close to my, my research. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes. You, thank you very much for the question. You also asked about performance. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, you know, I, I still like the idea of performance, performativity, performative acts. And, uh, you know, in the text uh, on um, uh, epistemic justice, I was talking about the uh, idea of apotropaic texts and how, you know, the performative acts uh, might be turned into uh, these ideas that some texts and some, some uh, pictures might actually have a, a very strong agentive value, which is, of course, not, not a new idea, but I was also thinking how to use the post-secular term to talk about, you know, images and words as a kind of prayers and uh, on, in terms of meditation and if they can build a kind of social shield that would somehow help us to, again, adapt to all this, you know, uh, crises which are just coming. This is nothing what is right now, right? We know that it's coming. Uh, and I'm not apocalyptic, of course, but I'm a historian. So uh, I, I see the signs. So, yes, so I do, uh, I do believe that the performative studies, these are, again, a field of studies that open the, the possibilities for, you know, not necessarily uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, ideas uh, to be included in uh, uh, in this academic uh, writing. So uh, no, no, I continue be to believe that that's important area. Okay, and uh, just one remark that now came to it came to my mind that it's not about broadening sh sensitivity, like becoming more sensitive, which I said that I want to correct. It's as if we were to create new sensitivity as if the goal was to see if there is another possible sensitivity because of the crisis turn, catastrophic also turn. Also of technology. I, somebody yesterday was giving a lecture, I was talking about the fashion and how the fashion designers are becoming to be interested in materials which have some strength that might enhance our uh, capacity to sense things. So uh, that's that's what's very interesting and important also. So that's we will have this Thank technological you. posthuman enhancement also. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your questions. And you know, I have to say that this is not always that I am a fan of my own beliefs. Um, so uh, this this is something that I struggle with. So the ongoing research and. Uh, I'm sure there are many incoherences and gaps in my thinking, but I just want to share, no, 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 I wanted to give you this <laughs> knowledge uh, that, I, that, I, uh, that I have, and I, uh, I would be happy if you could continue on your own way to, to uh, research these uh, ideas and develop, develop them. Thank you so much. And thank you very much, Eva, for your all gifts. This one and this upcoming because I'm sure we will meet you in another lectures and to read your articles and book. Thank you very much for all speakers and listeners here and the virtual space. And it was the, the last keynote uh, lecture uh, during this conference, but I guess there will be another conferences. Thank you. Of